Hi, Terry. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, folks, we're going to start with our third presentation of the day. Um, and I have you facing as much of the audience as much of the audience as possible. Um, and I will just introduce really quick. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm so excited to announce our third presenter for the day, Terry Lynn Hudson. Terry is a disabled, chronically ill queer actor and multidisciplinary artist and disability rights advocate living and working in Chicago. She has a BA in general studies in the humanities, concentrating in theater, film, and dramatic literature from the University of Chicago. She has studied at Second City, Vagabond School of the Arts, and Acting Studio Chicago. She has most recently performed as part of the Shift video installation led by Barak Ad Salil at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, and her voice can be found reading creepy short stories on Audible and on the Random Acts Scary Stories Around the Fire podcast. Terry is simply one of the coolest people I've had the pleasure of working with, and she brings such confidence and spirit to all her work. Her passion and grit is so clear in everything that she does. Please join me in welcoming Terry Lynn Hudson. The audience isn't the only group with access needs, attracting and retaining disabled talent. A list of things that have happened to me as a disabled actor at various points in my career. In a nationwide talent search for an actor with a mobility disability where the producing theater was providing housing, I asked if the housing was accessible and was told that the ground floor shared areas, kitchen and living area, were accessible, but seeing as it was a residential single family home, the bedrooms were all up a flight of stairs. An entity that prides itself on body inclusivity to the point of using it as a tagline held a cattle call dance audition where they said modifications would be made to the audition routine and that people who needed it would get individual attention, but instead modifications were offered for bad hips and bad knees at the top of the audition and absolutely nothing else, and no one was available for individual auditions. They also didn't provide video of the routine ahead of time so that people with movement differences not addressed by bad hips and bad knees could come up with their own modifications ahead of time, making it so that one had to try to figure out modifications in real time without crashing into a room full of people at the same time. I responded to a casting call specifically saying, all ages, races, and abilities welcome. When I asked where the audition would be held, the producer said that it would be at their apartment, up two flights of stairs with no elevator. An entity whose casting director saw me audition at a disabled talent showcase, invited me to audition, and held the auditions in their inaccessible upstairs rehearsal space. This happened multiple times. One entity in particular holds itself up as a paragon of accessibility in regards to services offered to the audiences. I witness and appreciate witnessing strong focuses on audience access. When I see focuses on disabled talent, I see it much more rarely and more as a thought exercise than anything concretely executed. I do know that we've had a lot of incremental changes over the years. Ali Stoker and Madison Ferris have been on Broadway. Unfortunately, although I've been a working actor for 30 years now, the incidents I previously mentioned are all things that have happened to me in the past decade. What I hear and what many of us have heard in response to these sorts of incidents is that we need to be more assertive, we need to advocate for ourselves, we need to make sure our needs are met. The onus is put on us to change the system, push
pushing back at one microaggression or barrier at a time. I'm not here to tell other disabled actors how to better self-advocate. Disabled folks could pretty much all teach courses in self-advocacy. We have to do it all the time. What I want to do is push back at the concept that we should have to put in twice or three times or ten times the work that non-disabled actors do to be afforded the same responsibilities. I'm sorry, to be afforded the same opportunities. We shouldn't. What I would love to see is for producing companies, training centers, educational institutions, casting directors to remove the barriers to begin with and understand why it's better for literally everyone for you to do so. The most insidiously pervasive ideas around disability inclusion that I still see and that I want to challenge is that we're still your very special episode actors. If you don't know what I mean by that, you're probably significantly younger than I am. Back in the day, whenever a normally lighthearted TV show wanted to tackle what they considered a sensitive subject, they'd say that up next was a very special episode. For my purposes, I'm going to call this The Crip Show. This would be a show that specifies a disabled character and the casting seeks out to cast authentically with a disabled actor. In theory, this is great. We want our stories told. We want authentic casting representations. So why am I calling it out? I'm calling it out because it perpetuates the situation where we aren't considered and aren't front of mind during the rest of your seasons or for any other roles besides the one that specifies us for casting. And that's a big, big problem. It still means you see us as disabled first and as talent second. Unless a character is expected to perform specific physical acts during the show that require specific stated abilities, there's no reason you can't cast disabled unless you're structurally unable to. And that built-in inequity is what I want to talk about what I want to enlist everyone watching and or listening in the fight against. And most pointedly, I want to propose some ways to solve this issue, ways in which some individuals and institutions have already implemented solutions. So first, let's talk about the shiny chrome elephant in, or most likely not in the room. Wheelchairs, the universal symbol of disability. Lots of theater companies are tied into leases and contracts in physically inaccessible spaces and can't afford to move or either can't afford to or aren't permitted to renovate. Here is a list of workarounds for this issue that I've seen and even participated in. Partnering with another company or entity with an accessible space. Many of your bigger producing houses with larger budgets have multiple spaces, and I've seen several offer reduced rents or even free rehearsal and or performance space to companies who are looking for that space for access reasons. And it shouldn't just be on the smaller companies to reach out and ask. If you have space you'd be willing to share, advertise that to your local storefronts. Theaters aren't the only ones with space. Although you may need other amenities that are more difficult to find outside a theater space, and there may be permits and other paperwork, there are library meeting rooms, park buildings, corporate office meeting rooms, common spaces and residential rentals. If you can't have us physically, have us virtually. We just spent the last several years learning how to virtually produce. One virtual show in every physically inaccessible houses season, even every other season, would do so much to help us build credits and relationships. If a full virtual production seems like too much, how about a virtual actor? Is there a voiceover role or a way someone could appear on a screen or projection? And if you're thinking everyone is tired of watching Zoom or virtual productions, you know what people aren't tired of at all? Podcasts. Do a serial or a podcast play. Produce some scripts you wouldn't necessarily put on your main stage and cast disabled talent. 
And if physical accommodation is still impossible and insurmountable for you, there are other disabilities and other accommodations you can make. Do you have a list of ASL interpreters on call? Do you have captioning equipment? Do you have a screen reader compatible soft copy of sides and scripts? And here is a list of possible solutions for very special episode syndrome. The short answer, folks, is just call us in. Do we meet the demographics for the character? Is there any reason the character can't be disabled? If not, call us in. Yes, we have the idea that, well, if you make the character disabled, then the entire thing ends up being about disability. And honestly, casting us more often will get rid of that because you'll get used to seeing us. We're doctors, teachers, parents, friends, love interests. We exist in all facets of life, and theater is a reflection of life. A lot of debates and discomfort around the implications of making one single character disabled can be very easily solved by not having there be only one disabled character. Casting more of us solves this more than casting less of us does. Audiences will adapt, and casting us will expand your audiences. A lot of us come with fans and followings already, and we love to see ourselves and support one another. Use that to your advantage. Now, assuming that you want to cast us and make a practice and habit of casting us, I'm often asked, where do you find us? A common excuse we hear for inauthentic casting is, but we couldn't find anyone. And I'm just going to stop you right there. A lot of casting practices can get fairly insular. People build relationships, work with people they know, and who they know just isn't often very demographically diverse. One point I constantly bring up is the constant exclusion of disabled people from all aspects of public life. This is a constant battle because separating us from everyone else is so thoroughly baked into our society. And often, unless it's a relative, a non-disabled person can be very hard pressed to name a disabled person they interact with on a regular basis, let alone one with particular skills and training. That being said, there are trained, professional, working disabled actors. The ones you know of who've achieved a certain level of fame and accomplishment didn't start where they are. They had to come from somewhere. Look at your communities. Most major metropolitan areas have some sort of disability-focused community center. Most schools are required to have some degree of access, although a lot of them are still failing at this. I picked a project once that was rehearsing and performing at a school theater, thinking that the access situation would be more ideal, and guess what? Audience space was accessible, and performer space had stairs. Yep. Your municipality should have an office for people with disabilities. Reach out, they can connect you to people. I've been known to put up casting flyers in rehab centers and hospitals. The pushback that I expect here is that we should be doing this work. We should be submitting like everyone else, just showing up at auditions, etc. In an access focused world, we would, but I can definitely tell you that over the past decade, I've spent countless hours trying to figure out the accessibility features and access assets of various theater companies to see whether or not I could audition for them and often came up with no information or incorrect or incomplete information. When I've approached theaters directly, I get reactions that make it seem like I'm just trying to paint a scarlet letter on them for all the ways in which they're not accessible and they just shut down and go unresponsive. We really need for you to do better. One thing that could be done to avoid this would be a database of theater's access assets. Do you have an elevator, ramps, a flat stage, a projector, captioning equipment, ADA regulation restrooms, a dressing room that can accommodate chairs and scooters, if theaters and producing entities would provide that information up front, it would save us countless hours 
of work and put us on a more even level with non-disabled actors with regards to what we need to do to prepare to work for you. So at this point, I'll give some benefit of the doubt. Say you've found us, say we're on your radar, say you've got some roles for us, and let's say you're making some casting decisions. A lot of problems we run into are in script. I've seen inauthentic casting happen, for example, because, well, the person needs to be able to get up and walk for this part of the story. Two layers here. One, disability is a spectrum and ambulatory wheelchair brace and crutch users exist. You can have both and cast authentically, just be specific, but also, who is that story for? Why is that convention being used? The stereotype that disabled people just sit around wishing we weren't disabled or wondering what life would be like if we weren't disabled is largely something that lives in the non-disabled gaze as opposed to being authentic to us and our lives. I'm still seeing plays produced about parents hand wringing over having a disabled baby. Yeah, just last year. The play itself is admittedly decades old, but a company decided to dredge it back up and produce it. We don't just deserve to work, we deserve good material, and we deserve stories that don't harm us. Lastly, I do want to remind everyone that the state of being non-disabled is temporary and fleeting. The sorts of access that we require honestly creates a better, safer, and more flexible working environment for everyone. What if an otherwise non-disabled actor didn't have to leave your cast because of an injury, because there was already an elevator and a flat entry and a flat stage? What if everyone got adequate meal breaks because people with blood sugar or other issues needed them? What if the clearance for wheelchairs backstage meant that no one was stumbling over wires or needing to be nimble enough to navigate around lumber or detritus? What if bathrooms and dressing areas big enough for chairs and scooters were also better fits for larger performers? What if we just made more space and made that space welcoming and navigable? I think we can do it. We, you, just have to want to. I left a lot of time at the end of this because I really want to have dialogue with people. If anyone has any questions, any feedback, any complaints or grievances, let's please let's take this time. Let's build some community here. Let's support and suggest and brainstorm, please. Hi, Terry. Hi. <laughs> I'm great. Great. This is Sahai Bear sitting here uh, attending this wonderful conference. Um, you've given some really excellent suggestions. Can you talk a little bit about um, the actors and contractual issues with them? doing radio only or some other uh or performing on other platforms what what has been your experience or have you had that experience with uh putting things uh you know on the audio platform and union issues is my is my question clear i think so um i think it may be a little bit out of my wheelhouse but it is clear first of all hello sahai it's so great to see you um I am non-union, and the fact that I've been in this business 30 years and I'm non-union is a lot of why I came up with this presentation, because there have been a lot of barriers for me. So I don't know all of the union rules. Um, I do know that personally, I have been doing a lot of podcast work, 
and a lot of audiobook work, and I do think that there's some flexibility and some different rules around those. I do know that people, like during the strike, were still able to do some of that work if they were union, but I would ask union people about that, and I am not one. Got it. Thank you so much for your list. Absolutely. Great. Any other questions? Hi, this is Millie Rose. I'm like right over here. Um, hi. Hello. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about some spaces or theater companies or any kind of area in which you see like really positive steps being taken, um, just like things that people are doing well and things that you would like to see continue or like places that we could go support um, that are producing really cool work that you are excited about. Um, I wish that was an easier question to answer. Um, I have spent the last three years working remotely because I'm immunocompromised. And I do know that a lot of companies have folded and a lot of people have lost their spaces. Um, I will say that I have done some interesting work over the last several years with Straw Dog. And when I was working in person, Straw Dog was a great space for um, inclusion and accessibility in my experience. I did get to work there in person sometimes. Um, let's see, who else is out there doing the thing? There is a theater company on the West Coast called Alter Theater that did some online work that I was really impressed with. Um, there are also disabled run theater companies, and that's actually something I was negligent about in my prepared speech. Um, here in Chicago, we have Tell and Tales Theater, and we also have the Inclusive Playwrights Project, and both of those are founded and run by disabled people. And they are both great resources for finding disabled performers and disabled playwrights. Um, who else is out there anymore? Um, as far as spaces, I just, I'm a little hesitant to say because I'm not sure who all is still open. I do know that Steppenwolf has lent space to um, Inclusive Playwrights Project and that they have their um, 1700 space is completely flat and has a good dressing and restroom space in it. I just don't know how competitive that space is. And I don't know what their rates are, but considering that they work with IPP, I want to say they have some flexibility for accessibility focused projects because IPP is not a big money operation. Okay, thank you so much. Hello, my name is Haley, and I don't know if this is like a specific question, but um, during the presentation, you talked a lot about like physical disabilities and things that are like more visual. Could you talk more about like the invisible uh, disabilities and like representation and accommodations, just some things that like we might see like actors and not see them as like a disabled person uh, just because their like disability is more like internal, if that makes sense? Absolutely. Um... I am physically disabled, so I speak a lot from that experience, but I also have what can be referred to as sort of a conditional level of, of visibility. There are people who can look at me and not know I'm disabled, so I've had to fight that fight because I'm not always in a wheelchair or what have you as well. And I will say that, once again, a lot of the things that I'm stating are things that will help everyone, like people with fatigue issues have you know trouble with stairs, inclines, et cetera. It's more exhausting than just navigating a flat space. Um, making people stand up all the time is a thing. Like you can have chairs and rehearse. You know, the, the, the idea that energy is sucked out of everything if everybody is not standing up all the time is really ableist. And that applies not just to people who have actual motor issues like I do, but people with chronic fatigue issues and pain issues can also benefit from sitting. There's also the food issue, like non-equity theaters are starting to follow the equity food break schedule, but that's a very recent thing. And previously we were just kind of expected to not eat for six to eight hours and people can't necessarily do that. 
and I've been in spaces where I've just been assertive about food, like, I am bringing food, and I'm going to eat, and you're going to suck it up, because this is what I need to do for my body right now. And that that is a self-advocacy thing, is just showing up and doing it, but also when people pass, they need to be prepared for that. So this is really just kind of putting the onus on the producing entities to go, okay, people are going to need accommodation. Maybe people might be running late for reasons they can't you know, avoid or might be tired. Maybe we need to work in more breaks, more food breaks, more sitting. Um, is anybody in pain? Can we like, or, you know, do we have people with sensitivity to the environment? Can we lower lights? Can we regulate sound? That there's a really just extensive list of things that we can do that would improve everyone's experience. So thank you for bringing that up. Great. Any other questions? So kind of along the lines of what you were just talking about, I think that what's important for people with disabilities, especially if they're invisible, is having their elevator speech, like knowing exactly what they need and asking for it. Because as someone with kind of an invisible disability, if if I don't ask for very specific things for specific situations, people will make the decision for me. Mm -hmm. And then you have to undo what they did to do and then do what you need to do. Um, the other thing that's important is to, I think like know the law and know what your rights are. Um, people tend to jump more if you can say, okay, well actually the ADA says this about effective communication or the ADA says this, you know, as a person with a disability, I'm entitled to, you know, ABC. So, um, you know, as a person with a disability, being an advocate for yourself means being knowledgeable about what you need. Um, and, and I found that um, the people with a disability don't always know what the options are that are out there. That's part of the problem, too. Like, they're they're unaware of what accommodations and, and what solutions. Oh, that was the other thing. If you go in and say, I need this, this, and that, and you come in with a solution, they're more likely to enact it than if you put all of the responsibility on them. I know that that is historically true, and I'm not saying that none of this was to say that we should not self-advocate. What I'm saying is that we should not be the only people who care about us. And that there are things that entities can do on a base level to make a disability friendly environment on a base level. People are always going to need other accommodations that aren't just solved by, you know, ramps, elevators, etc. So please don't misunderstand that I'm not saying that I'm saying that we should not self advocate. I'm saying that we should not be the only people advocating for us that it is completely possible and feasible and ought to be standard to expect disabled people to come into your spaces and to cover what you know to be or should know to be basic needs that we can possibly have. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, I think we have a question from our live stream. So I'm just going to hand it over to Monica. Yeah, um, Claudia in the HowlRound chat, um, I think you touched on this a little bit um, with Haley's question, but she said, what advice do you have for immunocompromised actors? <sighs> I wish I had more. That has been a really rough thing to navigate, especially during COVID. A lot of it is just Stick to your guns, set your boundaries, and do not waver on your boundaries because people will insist that you need to be in dangerous situations for your career. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to have a career if I'm dead, yo. And <laughs> so I have really had to adjust what my career looks like because there is very little safe performance space for immunocompromised people right now. People have just dropped a whole lot of precautions that they were taking. And you can 
set your boundaries, but that doesn't mean that people are going to honor them because I have definitely gotten offers where I'm like, yes, I will perform if people all, you know, COVID test beforehand and everyone is masked in the space. And I just get told, well, we're not going to do that. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to work with you. And that is just that. And I don't know what the solution is there because that's not just in the performance sphere. That is in every aspect of public life right now. I have been working with a an organization called Care Not COVID Chicago, just trying to get masking reinstituted in medical buildings because we don't even have that right now. So my my optimism for people outside of the medical field when people in the medical field won't show compassion for me to compromise people is just not very much anymore. I have really just had to reassess my career and go to remote only work. So I have been doing voiceover. I've been doing audio description. I've been doing podcast work. I've been getting into audiobook narration. And I know that people are like, well, I just want to perform. So do I. And I don't know what the answer is right now because I don't know how to force people's hand. If anybody wants to coalition build around that and try to come up with like a show of force and some solutions, I will happily get in the trenches with you. Hi, Terry, it's Ashna. Um, I I read in your bio that you were a theater student at UChicago, and I wanted to ask, uh, because a lot of us are like college student theater makers, I wanted to ask what advice you had for us um, to make the spaces we lead more accessible um, in the rehearsal room and in production spaces, um, and just in general in the spaces we work in. Ah. <sighs> So I, I will preface that I graduated U Chicago in 1995 and that they could have made some changes. And actually, I know they have because like I know that like the Logan Center for the Arts exists now and things like that. So not everything is being held in a hundred year old building with no elevators or one really, you know, crappy freight elevator. Um, but as far as making spaces welcoming and inclusive, you know, make sure that there aren't huge barriers to begin with is what I am harping on today as a baseline. And also just like I, I say, reach out, like if there's a disabled student's office or organization, reach out, go there and go like, hey, we want you to work with us. We want you to come audition and just make it so that they know that you you know they exist and that you are prepared to deal with them. I don't like the idea that, you know, we should be treated as the only disabled person anyone has ever seen or heard of every time we show up. A common line that I have heard in a lot of performance spaces that I've been in, and I don't just mean the physical space here, but just showing up as a disabled performer is something to the extent of, well, we didn't know anyone was going to need that. And what I'm asking entities to do is assume that there will always be somewhere, someone there who needs that. Assume it from the get-go. Always assume that someone will need extra rest time. Always assume that someone will need an elevator or a flat entry. Always assume that people are going to need more meal breaks. Always assume that somebody is going to show up who's not a straight size or who needs a bigger dressing room or who needs an accessible restroom. Always assume that we are going to show up is what I'm asking. Telling, honestly, and that that should be done at the college level as well because otherwise we don't get the same opportunities everyone got in college. And then we're 22 years old and we're going around and auditioning up against people who've done 20 more shows than we've had because they haven't had the barriers that we've had. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry. I think that's really great advice. Um, are there any other questions in this space? Yeah. Hi, Terry. I'm, I'm Matthew. I'm over here. Uh, thank you so much for being with us and your presentation. Um, 
our first speaker today was Ali Easton. She's a, a disability consultant. And I was wondering, um, in your experience, uh, have how have you interacted with disability consultants? Uh, obviously, I'm assuming there aren't enough of them. And she was mentioning that there aren't enough like certifications or programs in which people can really become well equipped to pursue a disability consultant route where uh, folks can advocate for actors in spaces um, where there aren't necessarily accessibility efforts being met. Um, and I was wondering how you've interacted with disability consultants or if you have in the past um, and what you see like that path looking like. That has been an interesting space for me to navigate. Most of the disability consultants that I have worked with have not been disabled, and that is a little awkward just right there. Um, there's definitely not enough of a focus on that, and there's not enough programs, and there's not enough access to those programs. But at the same time, I am a big fan of if people are able to work around this, because I do realize that with certain entities that your flexibility on hiring people without certain degrees, without certain certi certifications, et cetera, is limited. That needs criticizing as well. But backing up, um, disabled people living out in the community, as I mentioned in my speech, we have to assess spaces for access every single day. It's all we have done most of our lives or ever since we acquired our disability, if we acquired our disability later in life. Most disabled people would be pretty good at doing that job, you know, if you factor in other personality traits, et cetera. So it's something where if you have the capability to hire an outside consultant, instead of looking for a piece of paper like look for lived experience look for disabled people in the disabled community people who do advocacy work people who work with adapt people who here in chicago are active with access living or active with like their various disability organizations are all great resources and i would highly highly advise hiring someone like that if you have the flexibility to do so as far as getting more official certification programs because I'm not in the academic sphere. I have my degree and then I just never did anything else in upper academia ever again. I'm not sure how you get programs like that started. I was on an advisory committee for um, one university who was trying to build a curriculum and I don't know whatever happened after that they had a committee and we did a lot of talking and a whole lot of brainstorming and then got told well somebody's going to have to approve or not approve this so this may end up being a program and this may end up being nothing and as far as i know it's nothing so putting pressure on institutions if you have influence and connection in order to get them to take that sort of thing seriously is another avenue i think could be taken Thank you so much. Harry, I think that's a lot of the questions we have for you right now. Thank you so much for being so patient and answering all of them for us. Um, Terry's information and social media is linked in the welcome packet that is given to all of you. So I encourage you to check out all her really cool work and connect with her on social media. Is there anything else you'd like to say, Terry? I just want to say that self-advocacy is important, but that I've gotten to a point at 50 years old where I'm tired of being told with every single thing I want to do that I have to carve out a whole new path. And what I'm wanting to do here is to create a partnership and create a give and take where we as disabled people who constantly have to self-advocate and constantly have to navigate access aren't the only people who care and aren't the only people doing it and creating a framework that's access first so that it's not built on the back end of everything. I got into a conversation with someone about ramps once where I said, and this isn't always true, but in this particular case of the structure we were talking about, it was true. I'm like, 
The problem with this ramp is that it was an afterthought because you've got this space that was not built with flat entries and lifts for multiple levels to begin with, and someone had to figure out access after the fact. And what I'm saying is if we figure out access as part of anything we're building, we don't have to worry about how to accommodate a random disabled person who shows up because we didn't think about access. We may have to tailor what we have done to their specific needs, but the issue is not going to be as huge or as much trouble if we have already walked in with and built the structure from the ground up with access in mind. This is what I'm asking for everyone to build their structures, whatever their structures are, be they physical or just ideologically from the ground up with access in mind. Thank you, Sherry. That makes a lot of sense. And I hope that's like one part of what ITF can do is bring this information to people who are not disabled so that they can start creating these kind of spaces and not let the burden fall on just those with disabilities. Exactly. Thank you so much for being in this space with us today. Again, I think it's so cool that we can have someone zoom into a room full of people this way. And I really want to admire you, Terry, for, for doing that for us today and just giving us an example in real time of what hybrid models and remote accessibility can look like. So thank you so much. We're also grateful for you to you for being here in the space today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone, we're going to take a 15 minute break. So we're going to break till 340. And then we have our last and amazing last amazing presentation of the day, Dr. Tina Childress. So I will see you all here at 3.40. A reminder that there are toys, uh, sensory toys and water at the back of this room. And our quiet room is down the hall and to the left. Thank you so much. See you in 15. Thank you, Terry. I'm going to log off. This. Oh, um, yeah, you might have to log off this call because yeah. I'm not streaming yeah. through this. Mm -hmm. So, OK. Yes. I, I, in that case, thank you. And thank you so much. Goodbye. Keep it amazing. Thank you. Bye.